So how many of you guys got Jack's uh, slide with the rabbit of Angor? And the rest of you are going, what the hell is that, right? Monty Python humor, get used to it. This slide, this deck is full of them. All right, ready? All right, so, um, hey, how far am I when I in frame, out of frame? So I'm going to give my talk like this. <laughs> All right. There we go. All right. Cool. Welcome. Thanks for showing up. Wow, this is cool. Um, full room. Awesome. So my name is Raf. Um, I do uh, enterprise security strategy, uh, operational advisory, and things that require people to measure how well they're doing things. Do you want me to shut up for a second? Announcements. So after this, we finish at twelve forty. We're right on the schedule. Please visit next door our sponsor. Their lunch. Eat make their sure candy. You, make sure you stop by say hello. And after that, after you say hello, head to the third floor for lunch. We have in Martin's Barbecue and Grill, best barbecue in town. And it's thanks to you guys for coming to visit. So finish here, say hello, and then go to the third floor. No worries. All right, let's try that again. I work with him. He's cool. Um, so, th by, by the way, thanks for coming out, B-Sides. Um, really cool of you guys. Uh, this is a really, really nice turnout. Uh, they generally say that uh, I, when, when you do these types of events, about 70 to 75% of people show up. I think we got much better than that, which is awesome. Um, how many of you guys are locals? Nash Vegas, baby. Um, this is one of the cities we'd move back to. Um, I'd love to come back to to come to Nashville or maybe back to Atlanta. But so my name is Raf. I I'm, uh, I do enterprise security strategy, uh, operationalization, security intelligence, those interesting things. Um, I used to hack things and I hack boardrooms. I'm not really good with the hacking of stuff anymore. Um, but try not to hold that against me. Um, this talk is mainly about uh, how to measure success and failure of software security programs. Anybody here in development? Somebody please raise your hand. Sweet. Uh, software security people. Software security people that used to be developers? Okay, two. That I can. All right, well, whatever. Close enough. So, what's that? That's a little, that's a little tough the other way around, but. Perfect. Um, so, this is a, a, a brief, let's talk through a brief introduction of what KPI is. Everybody know what a KPI is? Your bosses do, if you don't. Uh, so, I think reporting on progress is a bit tricky. Um, so I think reporting on progress is a bit tricky. Uh, it's it's one of those things that I've been asked to do through my through my life uh, in, the, uh, in the enterprise corporate world. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have been. If you have aspirations of being management, and, and um, at some point you will, believe me, it just gets old. Um, you get asked this question by people that in finance that if you spend X, what does that actually mean? What does that mean for us? If I spend what, you know, if I give you a million dollars, what do I get out of it, right? Very, very... Uh, black and white kind of conversations. Um, first things first, how many of you guys here report metrics? Great. That's interesting. Uh, how many metrics do you track? Numbers. Let's throw, shout out a number. Not all at once, though. I'm sorry? Did you say 60 or 70? That sounds like my last job. Actually, we reported 184 on my last job. That was fun. Yes. Two? Three. Wow. That's a stark difference. Anybody anywhere in between there? <laughs> One? Okay. What is that metric? Okay, that's interesting. So I was once a victim of metrics, and now I'm a recovering uh, victim uh, of metrics. Um, the question for me became, did any of these metrics give me any insight? Because we used to record metrics all the time, and I'll give you an example later of a, ch of a chart that one of my clients provided me that had me staring at it for hours before I talked to them, trying to figure out what kind of sense to make of it. Um, and I think KPIs give us that, uh, that kind of insight, right? So KPI means key performance indicator. Shh, Scotty. Shh. KPI means key performance indicator. Uh, and the definition of, you know, you can find this on Wiki, but the part that really matters is, it, it talks about how you measure performance, uh, helping you define and evaluate how successful something is, typically in terms of making progress towards, here comes the money shot, 
the long-term organizational goals. Okay, when I say, when we say long-term organizational goals, what pops into your head? I love that some, who said that? The fact that the first thing that somebody said was profitability is brilliant, right? That's what I was at, I was going for that. I, what number am I thinking of? No. Um, so this implies that your organization has long-term goals. Shockingly enough, uh, a lot of the organizations that I've had the pleasure of working with over the last 15 years, and more specifically over the last six and a half at the current gig, um, don't actually have long-term goals. We go app to app, business to business, quarter to quarter, and we try to reduce the number of criticals in our applications. This doesn't actually get us anywhere because this is a merry-go-round, no, this is like the hamster wheel of pain, whoever coined that brilliant term. We don't actually get off the hamster wheel. Um, so the, the, the complete short version is, are we succeeding? Are we doing something right? This is a much harder question to answer than you would think. And it's, are we doing something right relative to our goals? And how much better are we than last week, last month, last quarter, last year? Again, really, really tough things to answer when you start thinking about it, primarily because these aren't questions you want to, that the IT people are going to ask. These are questions that people that run businesses tend to ask, right? So if you get, this is the quintessential, if you get 30 seconds in an elevator with the CIO of the company and he or she asks you, hey, didn't we just spend a million bucks on that AppSec program that you, that you pitched last year? How's that going, right? You don't get to whip out 70 uh, metrics. It, it, that's not going to happen, right? You get 30 seconds tops. What do you say? And that's the trick. So the trademark of good KPIs is this. They sh show you a relative distance to the goal. This means are you closing in on some kind of good thing, right? They establish relevance to the organization. This is shockingly, brutally uh, not done. It's weird. It's obvious, but it's not done much. Uh, they establish relevance to security. Um, so security tends to care about interesting things, but we get lost in the minutiae. Anybody feel like we get lost in way too many details sometimes, right? Um, and so what we need is context. What does this mean in a grand scheme of the organization we work for? I had a, I had a, uh, I ran into a, a CEO of, uh, one of the business units I used to work with in my last company, and, um, I, I, was uh, I was talking about how we, we weren't doing enough. I tried to pitch to him that we weren't doing enough security. And being a finance company, I thought this would sort of resonate. And the person looked at me and said, you know, I, I get what you're saying, but let me explain something else to you. If your organization whole heart, completely, whole hog, were to disappear tomorrow, I, we still exist. If I disappear tomorrow and my organization disappears tomorrow, you disappear. And I went, Got it. Makes sense, right? We tend to get a little wrapped up in our own, uh, I can't say what I want to say because this is the kind of place where I'm not allowed to say those words, but we get to, uh, we get, you guys remember the episode of South Park where they're uh, with Smug, right? All the Prius drivers? You know where I'm going with this? Okay. I'll, I'll just leave the rest to the imagination. So metrics versus KPIs. How do you convey improving? What does improving mean? This is sort of an existential question. Like, what does it actually mean? What does this all mean? Um, it's, the res it's the improvement as the result of effort. Right? So you do something, something gets better. The trick is, that's not always true. Because sometimes you do something and things get worse. Or worse yet, nothing happens. And then you have no idea what happened. Right? So, I I've done this before where we think that... Um, uh, if we only could get to scanning all the applications with some tool, security would get better. It turns out that's probably not true. In fact, that's probably a bad idea because um, if you've ever been, has anybody done this yet? Right, because the first step every organization I've ever met takes in software security is they buy a tool and they start scanning all their web apps, right? You know the problem with this? There's probably one of you doing the scanning. And if you're lucky like me and the CIA and the, the Top level IT execs is fine. You win. We'll pipe all the web apps through you. Starting tomorrow, all 725 of them. You go, wait, what? Right? Make sure you can actually handle the, the work that comes through. Otherwise, you get buried and then you become this, uh, the equivalent of an elephant trying to squeeze through a mouse hole. 
Well, and you know how that works. So this is, ooh, there's the blank button. So this is easy, right? So why are we so bad at it? Because we are. We report the wrong things. I think more importantly, how do we, how do we define success? Okay. And it, I don't think, I don't recognize anybody from the organization I'm about to put this up for, but if you know them, work for them, if you've seen this graph before or it's yours, I apologize. Um, but study this graph. Just take a quick peek at it. All right. So this is the number of issues by the OWASP top 10. Uh, and that scale goes up to 9,000, by the way. Um, that should trouble you to start with. Um, by quarter, starting with the first quarter of 2012, going all the way to the Q4 of 2013. What does this tell you? I was handed this and, and told, take a look at our software security metrics. Tell me if, how we're doing. Is this a successful or failing program? Yes, no, yes, yes, no. Right? Yet this ended up on a board of directors presentation. This is absolutely meaningless. And I'm not making fun of anybody because I've probably created several of these in my past, and I bet you have. Right? Because we create these things. People ask, how many criticals were there? And you go, all right, well, plot these by quarter, or by application, or by business unit. And here we go. And the day looks like that. And somebody goes, what does that mean? And you sort of go, well, hmm. And the worst possible time ever to do that is when you're standing in front of a group called the board of directors, or the board of governors, or the executive advisory board, or people that have executives in their name. So what does this show? All right, so look again. And now we've got a couple of inflection points here, A, B, C, and D. All right, you didn't notice those. So these are these are times. Cause I went back and said, All right, what what happened? And they go, well, around these times, the following things. So right around point A, they implemented mandatory software security testing. All right. So things took a bit of a dive. Around B, they made a major acquisition. As you can see, that acquisition was not so good. Believe me, this happens fairly regularly. So they integrated software security into the primary dev cycle at C, and they switched software security testing tools at D. Right? So here we go again. Turns out putting stuff into the dev cycle really is a good idea, although it's hard as crap. And then they switched tools because the one they were using with was too expensive, and so they bought a cheaper one. Not that that really means anything. So the graph is completely inadequate in my opinion. So here's some raw data, right? When we look at, so maybe, maybe I just thought maybe the, the graph was bad. So let's take, I went back to the raw data and I said, all right, so these numbers, like if I look at these, right, they go up, they start, they drop, drop, really drop, dramatically increase, slightly drop, massively drop, massively drop, then dramatically increase. You're like, what in the world is going on here? So from Q1, uh, to Q2, we had a 49% decrease in A1, and then we had a 72% increase. Yeah. Right? So once again, even if we just did this part, forget the rest of the graph, just this, what does that mean? Anyone want to venture a guess? It's not it, it, right. It's, cor it's correlated to exactly nothing. In fact, it's correlated only if you care only about how many red marks there are on a board, right? This is great for selling widgets and dashboards, pretty bad for everything else, including security. So clearly this is data without context and actually shows zero impact to anything, right? So let's talk about, let me talk about how I, what makes a good KPI. And I said this in the beginning, relevant, relative distance to the goal, relative, uh, relevance to the organization, and relevance to security. That last graph had none of those, right? Relative distance to a goal. Heck, we didn't have a goal. Our goal was to plot things on a graph. Success. Move on, right? Box checked. So I, in, in thinking through this, and this is a, uh, some assembly required, batteries not included, you know, um, some parts not for use with some sets. What other disclaimers can I think of? Uh, this may not work for you, but it's worked for places that I've, uh, that I've implemented this. And so I, I focus on four key points when I think about those three things in, in an enterprise. Here's four things that I think software security. So I think about impact to effort, right? What does that mean? Anyone want to take a guess of the impact to effort? 
I want to call on somebody. No. No. Impact to effort. Uh, I'm confused. Uh, maybe. Um, probably not. Probably no, though. Impact to effort. Okay, so think about this way. Uh, those of you that are developers or have been developers or want to be developers or know a developer once, um, impact to effort is how much time do you spend? Like when you scope out, if, you're, if you've ever been the project manager on anything, you scope out an effort for everything, right? There's this, something we used to call the LOE, level of effort. And it's usually in man hours or person hours if you prefer because we're a politically correct world now. Uh, woman hours, person hours, man hours, thing hours, I don't know, just hours of effort. And so if you think about how much something takes, we're perpetually trying to, to decrease the amount of effort, the amount of hours it takes to get a project from idea through the we're done with coding phase. Okay. So impact to effort means it's the impact of a security item. So something you're doing that's, that comes from the security organization to the overall effort of the project. Right? So this is very simple. It's like this. Some security item, its impact on the effort. And so give, let me give you a couple examples. Things like static analysis processes, uh, dynamic analysis, integrating of testing tools, developer awareness. These are things that have impact on developers. Right? If you put people through, developers through developer awareness training, it means one of two things. Either they're going to go sit through uh, a 40-hour class that you're going to teach or 20-hour class or 10-hour class. Those are 10 hours, 40 hours, 20 hours that they're not coding that they are not meeting their goals that their management sets for them, right? Unless you're asking them to come in on a weekend or off hours, in which case, lots of luck. So the development effort is the person hours required to complete existing tasks. This is how things are measured. So I have a quote here um, from, I've got lots of these because these are really important because these are uh, program management people. By adding a dynamic testing process, we initially added 25% effort. Ouch. Right? But over four quarters, now it only adds 10%. Translated into English, this means the developers hated us a lot. Now they don't hate us so much. Right? The problem is this has to, whatever, so adding dynamic testing had to become a mandate. Once it became a mandate that they have to do it, adding 25% effort is brutal, right? Factor that, take 40 hours into that. That's, that's a lot. That's 10 hours extra they're working. My math is right, right? Um, coffee's kicking in. So that's a bunch of hours they're, ex they're having to account for your processes. So how do they streamline that back out? And that's where you guys come in when you do this. So this is what a, a uh, I2E, impact to effort, this is what it looked like initially. So we, we, plotted this uh, from, from the, the, the time frame that we uh, uh, analyzed this. And it turns out initially it was, it was you know, somewhere around the, um, initially they added 25%. And it actually got worse. They added 30%. It got all the way as bad as 30% and it came down to 10. Anybody want to guess as to why that went up? Yes. Dropping a product on somebody's desk and saying, use this now, not a, turns out that's not really effective. I know, I'm shocked too. So we're showing that we're impacting the app dev process less over time, right? This is the how much developers want to, you know, uh, cut the cord on the elevator when I get in it factor, right? Over time, yes, that's the idea. And, and you're, you're either reading ahead or you've seen this presentation before, or you're reading my mind, in which case, creepy, both of you stop it. Um, it really doesn't tell, this really actually doesn't tell us if it's helping security yet, right? But that's okay, we'll get there. All right, next one is impact to release. Anyone want to take a guess as to what that is? Ah, there we go, schedule delays. All right, how many of you guys have been in this one? This is like the longest, oldest, world's oldest AppSec punchline. Right? We've, we've, we've developed the project. We've tested the project. Okay, security guys, gals, people. Uh, 
This thing goes live on Sunday at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I know it's Friday at 1.15, but can you go ahead and really run your thing, do your thing, and certify this so we can release it? Never happens, right? I have personally never been a victim of this more times than I could possibly count. Usually on days where I had tea times. Really annoying. Because um, it's really hard to get a VM from a golf cart. I tell you what. Um, releasing, uh, so this is the re security item to a release timeline. It, really simple. So uh, other examples here. So integrating security testing early into development. Providing templates for fixes. Right? Defining pre-built code modules. How many of you guys do any of these three? Why not? If you don't. One of the things that I found over time that was a humongous time suck for developers, this assumes that you don't bid out every project to lowest bidder. Because if you do, you're screwed. Forget about any of this. Um, I, I genuinely mean that. I've tried that. It doesn't work. Um, one of the things that I found works phenomenally over time, and it goes back to the problem of every time a developer gets the you have SQL injection, go fix it thing, they all solve it in their unique little snowflake way. It's not a bad thing. It's not a commentary on how developers work. It's just how your human brain works, right? We're not automaton. We don't magically think the same way the guy next to us or the gal next to us does. So, again, one of the things that I found that was phenomenal in, in decreasing the amount of time it takes to fix a bug is... After a certain time of every, every, every SQL injection taking 30 hours to fix, I went, you know, why don't we just pay somebody, stop, the, stop take one app, sec team, or app dev team that's sitting around doing nothing, give them a little bit of training on what SQL injection is, and at the time actually it was cross-site scripting. Uh, this was before, by the way, the, uh, the OWASP ISAPI came out, because by now we'd be using it. Uh, but we taught them, this is what we should avoid, write a module that we can simply take junk Shove it in, and good stuff pops out. And they did. It turns out it works for almost all conditions, except for a few edge cases. So every time cross-site scripting came up to on a report, we'd go, go reference this internal doc, drop this code in, it works. Right? Right, uh, wrap all your, uh, all your uh, uh, variable calls in this. Done. Don't even bother. No thinking required. Just do it. Here's how to, in fact, here's some sample code. Right? We even did some Java doc, cause, because Java was the thing everybody developed in and sort of still is. Um, so defining pre-built code modules was humongous. So this is the number of person hours required to complete an existing task. And here's, here's another great quote. We were able to show that we could release faster. I'll pause while your brain explodes slightly. If security was involved earlier in the, apps, in the application's development. So it turns out that where security gets mandated, because and when the realization that security is a big deal, Right? It turns out that we add a lot of, lot of slack to the end of projects. And project managers generally don't like it. So the first couple of times, they try to figure out cool and cute ways around us. Like, for example, that you'll hear things like, oh, well, see, I didn't know about this until now. On the 37th time, that doesn't work anymore. Um, but if we get involved earlier, it turns out we take the lag time off the end, the, the, the trailing uh, time that we add, keep adding on to the end. We actually were involved in a, at a point in time where um, we had, apparently our vendor, our development vendors were so good at getting money out of us, the contract was written such that if they have to fix code, we pay for additional hours. So I was hurting the organization twice. Once by forcing them to take a longer release cycle, and now they have to pay for additional development work. You know the first thing we fixed? Contract language. <laughs> it's amazing. When you change contract language, it says any time you find security uh, code that is not compliant to security, you're required to fix it at your cost and at your penalty. Shockingly, code quality goes up. I don't know. It's a miracle. Anyway, so the impact to release, again, initially you'll always see that big bump, and over time it should decrease. So what we're showing is the impact of the release process over that gets less over time. All right, so impact to uptime. A little black magic? No, nope, I think I got it. I, we got this one licked. So the impact to uptime, realistically, is the, imp is the impact of a security item to the uptime of the application or service. So give me a couple of things that would impact uptime.
Okay, so the typical bad hack source thing. Expand on that. Okay. Okay. Somebody's going to hit the one I, I'm thinking of that that's probably the, what do you think the most likely cause of downtime is in most of your companies? <laughs> no, but close. Um, so there was a there was a company that actually did uh, that had some really smart metrics people that did a study internally, and it turns out their biggest uh, cost of security related downtime is people patching. Because and it's not the, oh, we have a maintenance window, the app's going down. It's the, hey, we patched it. Oh, nothing else works now? Oh, I guess we didn't regression test that enough. Maybe we should roll back the patch. Oh, that broke other things? Well, I swear we only rolled back the patch. Or uh, that patch is not roll backable. Roll backable? I make up words. It's okay. Don't worry. Um, right? How many, anybody ever been involved in that where you apply something, it's been regression tested to on everything, and all of a sudden, nothing works afterwards? You're like, uh. <laughs> Well, <laughs> it's secure. <laughs> so security, things that you do that impact uptime. So here's some items that I think um, are interesting. Continuous security monitoring. Anybody do this? OK, good. Continuous and or regular testing. You know, we forget a couple of things about the SDLC, folks. It's like we raise the kids. We send them off to school, go, all right, done. We're going to move on with life. And we forget that there's this whole thing where they keep coming back and asking for money. So one of my friends tells me um, that they're still there, right? We have these apps that we write, we test, eventually we release, and they're secure at the time. And stop me if you've heard this one, but if you don't do regular testing on them after they've gone live, somebody else is going to. They probably don't work for you. Not the way you're thinking. The problem is there can be new flaws introduced into, into the application without actually releasing any new code, right? New creative ways of exploiting SQL injection, new creative ways of overflowing buffers, because that's a problem we solved back in the 70s, 80s, that we still have a problem with, right? So what happens? We release an app, it goes live, it's secure the day it goes live. 30 minutes later, somebody goes, you know, there's an interesting flaw in that code that was there all along, but now we know how to test for it. But if you're not testing it out in production, you, you're going to let things go, and you're hoping that somebody else doesn't find them because you're not. You're also race, kind of tiptoeing because how many of you guys have done this? I have broken an app by, use, by testing it in production. Yeah. Awesome time, right? Because the security guy just broke the app and created downtime again. Well, you can't test things in prod, but the hell I can't. I need to. So that's a fun fight, right? So then you get into the uh, passively testing things. I'll let that just go. But so continuous security monitoring. We, we, we release apps, and we just assume that they're going to go out there and, and, you know, and, uh, and, and be good. Um, and they're not. The reality is they get poked and prodded all the time. The internet is a bad place, people, right? Um, so a friend of mine who has uh, two, two kids now uh, in grade school likened it, and this is the best analogy I've ever heard, likened uh, putting your app on the internet to, you know, in Hall when Halloween when you were in grade school, they, uh, they did those, like, spooky things, and they would put, you know, they could tell you to put your hand in a dark box, and they tell you touching eyeballs. It's just really jello with grapes in it. But you're like, ew, eyeballs, right? You never know what you're going to put your hand in. That's the internet. You're welcome. So <laughs> an, app, an application service event that causes downtime due, due to a security-related issue. Notice I say it's a configuration issue. It's an attack. So a lot of these are self-inflicted head wounds, right? For those of you Monty Python inclined, your arm's off. No, it isn't. Um, but, but because you do it, just because you do it to yourself, doesn't mean you don't get to count it. It's downtime. So how do you avoid that, right? So 
Um, I had a uh, I had an interesting another interesting quote. We were able to prove that remediating all discovered SQL injection issues caused less application downtime. And I'm going to go back a couple slides. What do I have highlighted here? Remediation of exploitable vulnerabilities. Okay. <sighs> So the reason I have this highlighted is because every app you'll ever test will have more things to, to fix than anybody can possibly fix in a reasonable amount of time. So at some point you have to figure out what gets fixed, right? And what we just have to deal with. Because what are the three things we do with issues? Uh, accept, mitigate, or defer, right? Transfer to slash defer. So not all of them fall into the mitigate bucket. Because let's face it, we don't have that much time or money or people or, or smarts. So we remediate exploitable vaults. So what this quote is telling us that by, by uh, remediating discoverable, discovered Google injection issues, we can cost less application downtime. Works for me. So the uh, impact to uptime in hours, right? Less impact is good. Having to break your own stuff less, also always a good thing. So we're showing that removing injection vulnerabilities, which are easily exploitable, reduces downtime. I know this is not exactly rocket science to anybody, but this is true. So the last one that actually does have something to do with security directly is the impact of residual risk. And it, this is the impact of a security item or, or uh, to residual risk of an application or service. So this is the stuff that gets left over after it goes live, right? All right. So these are these are bad things that just are going to continue to be bad, and you can't do anything about it. Because um, if anybody have any fragile applications in their network, you know what I mean by fragile? Wait, wait, wait I think I, I talked about this with some of you guys. I, I, you see some familiar faces, but basically this is the hey, we're going to prototype something for a client. We're going we're gonna to have Franken app a couple of these things. We're going to borrow this developer, that developer. We're going to take some reasonable code, some stuff from open source. Hey, some stuff I found by Google coding. Uh, by that mean, I mean Googling and copying and pasting. And we're just going to prototype it. It's not production. We just want to show it to the client. Oh, the client like it? Production now. Don't touch it. You're like, but if I breathe, it falls over. Then don't breathe. Right? But I need to scan it. No, 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 no. That's bad. That client needs that app. How many of you guys have been victim of fragile apps? Oh, suck! Because they never go away. Right? Because we never actually build them the right way later. Because once they're there, they're there, they're done. Don't fall for that. So, some other security items that I think really impact here is manual peer review of code. Uh, required stage gates. Anybody uh, use Six Sigma processes? Anybody former GE -er? <laughs> Ooh, lucky people. Um, so required stage gets with production security sign off. How many of you guys have direct accountability if you're doing AppSec uh, to go no go decisions? One. Was that just a, like a snarky <laughs> figures? Right. It, here's the, so and you guys read the White Hat uh, report that Grossman and, and company put out regularly. The 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 one thing that I always get out of it. Go read those. Those are brilliant. Um, the one thing that I always get out of it is the number one thing consistently year over year that makes security issues decrease over time is that last item. It's the accountability by line of vis business vice president. What this means is, and I'll tell you a story. So a long time ago in a kingdom far, far away, known as Connecticut, um, I had an office, and, and we, uh, we tried to get all the apps in the business to go through security processes. Eventually, we sort of kind of succeeded. The problem was every PM had this, the, the, the same battle cry, right? Oh, the client wants this released immediately. Oh, you came in at the very last moment, and you're telling me it's going to take another three weeks. I can't take that kind of a hit. I don't have that kind of budget. Oh, these are issues that should have been found ages ago, but these are, that's not even my code, right? Heard this before? Yeah? So we're like, okay, so how do we do this? Um, and at the time I thought, you know, I'm just going to get all these PMs to sign off on the fact that they're accepting all these risks. So I would, you know, write up a risk report, send it to them. 
they would send back an email or if they're in the same building, si physically sign off on, yes, I, John Smith, accept this risk, blah, blah, blah. What sucked is they were all just like signing off on it. Like, this isn't working. And I couldn't understand why. And I went for work for, uh, we had a new CISO, a gentleman named Dan Conroy, if anybody's uh, ever privileged enough to work under him, he's over at City now. But, um, so Dan basically said, look, um, you're doing it wrong. You're going to people that really have no stake in risk to accept risk. So we're like, oh, okay. Well, so what does that mean? He goes, find the person that's responsible, that actually is the officer of that line of business, write that same thing up to them, then go get the project manager's signature, and make them go get their boss's boss's signature. You know how many, exactly how many times that was tried by a project manager? Once. It was tried one time. You know how many times it succeeded? That many. Because then you're asking a person that's an officer of the company who's actually legally allowed to accept risk, which I've written up in such a way, by the way, the caveat here is that you understand business speak and you actually can explain what this means to the company, right? So I explained as best I could that this was a bad idea and that it wouldn't, you know, the impact of going forward unmitigated was worse than the impact of taking a slight hit and getting it at least temporarily mitigated. Got in front of the VP, the VP looked at me, looked at this, and said, I don't get it. Why are we not fixing this? And that conversation ended. After that, everybody that got that piece of paper went, I'm not, I'll just sign off. I go, wait, why, why is there a line item for our CEO? Yeah, all right, fine. I guess we'll find money. Magically, fill out this guy. So the residual risk is the level of uh, residual risk in the application as a result of security efforts, right? So for each line item of, uh, for each line of business that reported risk metrics up to the VP successfully in a way that made sense, residual risk decreased. <gasps> I know, right? Everybody's shocked. When your boss's boss's boss gets a clue as to how bad things are, sometimes they go, uh, I don't like that. And magically the people below them that report up really, really well, don't get to hide behind six levels of management, and magically things get fixed. So um, so here's a slightly different chart, and I probably should have fixed colors on this, but I blame RSA um, for the charting. But uh, So you've got a couple of different apps, right? And we went by, um, so there's AppX and App, 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 AppX and AppX Prime. So if you look at one, the first two lines, right, every time we went and got VP accountability, the graphs dramatically shrank. Now, they didn't go to zero, which is the key here. It's not like the VP is going to go, okay, fix everything. I have endless supplies of money. But you have to be able to say, look, the risk of going forward with this is greater than the risk of taking a break, fixing it. Or maybe sometimes the answer is maybe we just don't do this. I've, I've had projects where you bring it up and they go, so, you're telling me this is going to cost another 300 grand to fix. And you go, yep. And they go, so great, the app took 25 grand to write. They're like, okay, so the math there doesn't work. You go, fine, just screw it. Uh, scrap the app. Never went live, just died right there. Right? Sometimes it just doesn't make sense to fix. So we're showing that raising accountability to the line of business VP residually risks, residual risks fall greatly. If there's nothing else you take away from this, remember, just let that burn in the back of your eyeballs for a while. Because this makes a difference. And when you, we get, you know, people talk about you have to speak to business and understand what's going on. You have to understand why the organization would care about this. So you can't just say we can't go forward with 37 SQL injections because look at you and go, huh? But if you have numbers to back that up, for example, that SQL injection unmitigated causes downtime and you can actually prove that by, uh, like one of the KPIs I showed you earlier, and downtime causes monetary loss. We know that, right? Especially if your business relies on uptime. So if you can prove that security incidents of this caliber that you're proposing that get fixed cause downtime, and then you know how much downtime costs the company, this is a really easy argument to make. But what you realize, too, sometimes is that sometimes it's okay to go forward with it because the risk of stopping is actually greater than the risk of fixing, or not fixing rather, right? So the risk of letting the apps go with, the, with vulnerable is not as big as taking the extra time, and especially if you've got like, especially if you've written an app that's gonna be, um, it's two weeks before the Super Bowl, 
and the application is at a URL that's about to be published in, in during halftime at the Super Bowl, yeah, asking them for an extra week, probably not a good, not going to happen, right? Oh, well. So in that case, your idea, the thing you're proposing is super duper extra monitoring. Then you get to figure out what that looks like. But you'll probably get the funding for that, right? So you got to adjust tactics. So let's defining, let's talk about defining a set of KPIs. So this is from a real life example, and we had to first define what is the goal of the effort. All right, day one of we're going to implement a software security program, or day five thousand four hundred forty-two when you realize we haven't gotten anywhere in the last X years. Stop what you're doing. Take a take a break. Take a clean whiteboard and go. What are we trying to do? What is the point? Why are we here? Why are we asking for money? Why are we trying to fix things? What is the point? Right? What are we trying to ultimately do? And start with the easy one, the IT security context. So for this, right, minimize injection, these are A1 defects in new, new, net new, never seen before code, software releases. So what we're trying to, so there's three types of apps, guys. Net new, what are the other two? Legacy and the one that everybody forgets? Existing pipeline. Right? Because there's always apps in flight. Retrofitting an airplane while it's flying does not work well. Same with apps. So there are things you can't do anything about. There are things that it's dangerous to try to screw with while they're happening. And then there are things that haven't happened yet that you can tack on stuff. That is perfectly easy. I don't, I don't recommend that as a first step, or if you want to make a big impact, I do not recommend attacking either legacy apps because they don't have budget, right? Legacy apps have been there. How many of you guys have code in your enterprise that's been there longer than you have? How many of you guys have code in your enterprise that the person that wrote it is no longer with us? And I mean alive. <laughs> it's shocking how many hands go up when I do that, when I ask that question. Go ahead, find vulns in that and ask somebody to fix it. They have to pull people out of retirement. Newsflash, that isn't going to happen. So then there's the other apps, right? The 27 that are currently being developed now in various stages. Go ahead, try to jump in and go, oh, by the way, I know you didn't allocate any budget for this, but I want you to go ahead and start fixing security stuff. They're going to go, <laughs> no. So what new stuff, stuff that's coming down the pipeline, right, or release, X plus one of this application, go ahead, by the way, next time, we're going to tack something in here. But the other mistake I think people make a, a tremendous amount is trying to understand the whole elephant or trying to solve the whole problem at once. Or you can say boil the ocean or what are the other really crappy acronyms, right? Or acronyms, analogies. Well, whoo, what time is it? Um, so we want to minimize just a one, just injection defects. So those are the ugliest. Those are the most common. So those, those are the ones that we identified and solved in 1998. <laughs> so let's show progress, right? What security did? So we security introduced self-service. Self-service is the key. Static analysis tools in the development lifecycle. All right. What do you think? It, what, do you, what do you think the impact was? Not all at once, though. So the, initially, the impact was prohibitive where it was used because people went, I just don't have the time for this. I don't understand it. I don't know what it does. I don't, know I don't understand the output. I don't understand how to generate input. <laughs> or it doesn't work. What's that? Or I just don't want to. It's a perfectly legit, well, it's not, but it is. Um, but with effort, this became manageable. So let's look at impact to effort. So the impact to effort, and those dotted lines are baselines, right? So the impact to effort, right? Initially rolled out at the baseline Q4 2012, uh, hypothetically speaking. The, during the initial, uh, that's the baseline, right? So that's, we take that baseline. And the initial rollout, impact to effort, shockingly, effort always went up initially. Why? Because you're dropping some new thing on somebody's desk and saying, by the way, starting tomorrow, you're going to use this. Where they don't throw you out of the building, they say, uh, sure, begrudgingly, and then they start grinding their axe and trying to figure out ways they can cut your brake lines while you're not looking. Um, the next thing that everybody does is product training. So shockingly, product training doesn't have the impact we all think it does. 
But you know how we figure that out? By measuring. I know, facts are weird, right? And then we did um, IDE automation. And it turns out that actually had a much bigger impact. And then we did work stream integration. And it turns out that actually helped quite a bit too. But it didn't help the same with all four dev teams that we tracked. Because here's the other key. Not everybody works the same way. Different people respond differently to different things. This is why software security programs that you borrow from somebody else, the way they did it, will fail categorically in your organization. Why? Because we are not all the same. Yes, we are all special snowflakes, and we all think just a little bit differently, and everybody's got their you know, fragile egos, and everybody has the way they work, and the way they think, and the way they set up their desktops, and their build environments, and the people they like to work with, and the people they hate to work with, and the times they work, all this stuff, right? So we have to factor all that in. All right, so what about impact to release? Well, initially, if, if you go across that baseline, during the initial rollout, every t all four dev teams saw a negative impact. I know, I'm shocked too. Um, we did product training. Again, you'd think product training would be like the thing. And I always thought it would be like, the, I just have to show you how to use the product, magic things will happen. Turns out that's, that's just not true. Right? IDE automation, okay. Right, that was good. But if you look at the first one, IDE automation did almost nothing. Because they still hated the product. <laughs> Automating it just takes them out of the equation. Um, and then workstream integration. Turns out workstream integration in some places worked brilliantly. In other places it did nearly nothing because they still hated the product. But you can see Dev Team 3, we almost got back down to where the baseline started. Heck, I'm ready to throw a party at that point. Right? I'm not getting daggers thrown at me when I walk through that bunch of cubes. So what about impact to uptime? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I don't have the raw data here, but um, well, I mean, visually, you can. App one is uh, it wasn't too bad, but as a percentage, they were pretty much all equal. Right, as, as far as how much they dropped, except for four. Four was just sort of didn't like, didn't want to do it. Can't make me do it. You can't force me. I'll begrudgingly do it, but I'll do it poorly kind of thing. The percentages generally fall in line, I would say. Uh, but if you can get close to back to your baseline, I mean, it, if you can figure out how to go below the baseline, I like to use you as a case study. Um, I, I, people have claimed to have done that. I just want to know how. Because I clearly haven't figured it out in, what, 10 years. Uh, but you can, I think you can get close. Sure. Yep, and, that, and that's the key, right? Right. And whether you're writing in PHP, Java, or .NET, the, the, the differences will be based on language and how easy it is. Yeah, that's true. So impact to uptime. Take that graph in for a second. I don't know what happened in App Dev Team 1, but I like it. Right, the security-related downtime events. Uh, I'll tell you a secret. Uh, app team, the app one, app dev team one. Turns out that um, a lot, a lot of their, uh, a lot of their security stuff uh, happened initially. It was very, very ad hoc. And it turns out that they, uh, they misfired and broke a lot of their own stuff a lot. So once we got change control under control and security tools that didn't just randomly break things, it turns out all their incidents went away. Because that app was internal, and when I say internal, it was inside the firewall. <laughs> um, but nobody was actively beating on it that we could figure out, right? So, hey, we stopped shooting ourselves. Cool. I mean, it's still downtime we decreased, right? Whether it's whether it's we prevent our own people from breaking it or others, and still not breaking as much. But numbers are powerful, and I think these graphs are much more powerful than that first one we saw. These have some context to them. Let's talk about impact to residual risk. How do you guys think that back? What do you think is going to be the single most defining thing in that and that graph and this coming graph? Out of those four things that we did. 
All right, training, ID integration, workstream integration. What do you think is going to be the most impactful? Anybody? All right, well, here, here's the graph. So if you look between Q1 2013 and Q2 2013, turns out just getting them a little bit of info on the product and on what they're doing, turns out that, that actually dramatically decreased stuff. All right, the risk went down. But again, we're only looking at, in this case, A1 and A2 of the OWASP top 10. So there's, for the adventurous I have, uh, is bi impact to business, and no, I don't have a slide for this because I haven't figured out one that I'm allowed to share yet because these are all very, very tailored to whatever organization. But how do you do impact to business? All right, so if you're adventurous, figure out the impact to business, figure out what to calculate, and let me know what you come up with. I'd be curious. I'm pretty easy to find on Twitter. So is this approach perfect? The answer is, of course not. Do these KPIs work everywhere? Nope. In fact, some of these may just be ridiculous at your institution. But are they better than your existing metrics? If you're tracking 70 and you go down to three that are meaningful, or if you're tracking only three, but you go to three that are meaningful, excellent. Right? I think we need to strive to do better and, and start demonstrating meaningful progress. Just less red on a dashboard is utterly meaningless. Having less, having less red on a app dashboard, the questions I immediately have is, okay, so is the, is the tool worse? Did you scan less? Were there more applications and you, that you just had less issues with? Like what skews that graph? And the answer is everything, right? You do acquisitions, you scan more, you find less, you find more, the tool's misconfigured. Uh, they don't give you the right credentials to the application. You miss an entire piece of code. Like all kinds of things skew that. Any questions? Not comments, I think we kind of went a long way. Anybody have any thoughts on this? What was the cost of the Oh, um, <laughs> a consulting engagement. <laughs> But it turns out that the cost of, um, the, the actual human cost of having to go figure all these things out and put them on paper and, and actually collect these uh, made more sense than continuing to do random buckshot approaches to try to, you know, get these things done. Yes? Right. Rubber stamping is bad, right? That, that's, that's ultimately bad because then you've got a decision that was backed by somebody in power and you're done. That, so that's a, that's a card that you don't get to play often. But when you're going to play that card, make sure you know the outcome. Right. So this is one of those times where if I'm going to, if I'm going to go to battle with an, uh, with a program manager, an app manager, I know what the outcome is going to be. I've already talked to that CIO. I already know they have a low tolerance for risk. I already know that that client that they're going to postpone the, the release for is going to be okay with it. I know that the money could maybe be found or stolen from a different project. Right? Know these things before you walk into them. Because the first time you walk into a room like that and you get your head chopped off because you haven't done enough homework will be your last. Because from then on, nobody believes a word you say. Yes. Competitive. That's interesting. But again, that's a car you don't get to play very often, right? So the other thing that um, the other thing that I'll, 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 and I'll, I'll one, more, one question I'll, the, the, one more thing I'll, I'll add to this and I didn't state this enough or I just maybe I just didn't state it because I didn't have a slide on it but 
in a culture where, in, and those of us that are lucky enough to work in really large complex companies where you have multiple CIOs and multiple businesses on down the line at infinitum, you can create a race to the bottom. What you do is you take a, you create a dashboard of these, take three KPIs, create a dashboard and a stoplight for each one of them, right? Define the metric or the KPI, define what red, green, yellow means. Put each business's name on it and put it on a, on a, uh, on a flat panel outside your enterprise group CIO's office. So that every time somebody walks by there, they go, why is my group red and everybody else is orange? Because there's nothing quite as powerful as an app dev manager getting a call from their boss's boss saying, dude, why are we red? What are we doing wrong? Because they're not answering to you, the security person. They're answering to their boss's boss. And believe me, execs get, a, get pretty competitive in that space, right? But you have to make them want to race to the bottom. But of course, you have to give them something to race to. Otherwise, they're not going to go to zero, I promise. Yes, question somebody. About seven years of having no clue what's going on. And I think by then they probably chewed through about a million and a half in budget. Um, and the AppSec person, I think they were on their third one. You have to go, th they, you generally go through a lot of pain before you. So this is one of those self realizations that I actually don't know what I'm doing. Right? This is why, uh, this is the old guys don't ask for directions thing until they run out of gas and they're stranded. Um, right? This is why my phone is the greatest thing ever because I'm never lost again until I listen to Google. But, um, so we have to, step one is admitting you have a problem, right? If you've got a software security program that you cannot answer the question, are we doing better to an executive of the business, stop, think, just think about this KPI approach for just a second. And, and just think about it, right? There are better ways. Because continuing to throw money, because I think the one thing we complain about uniformly in the security community is how nobody listens to us. We do stuff, nobody cares, right? But I think people do. It's just maybe we're not approaching it right. We're continually throwing money into a project that hasn't demonstrated benefit is really hard. That boulder gets heavier every year. And eventually it goes squish. And then you get the opportunity to start over or find a new job. Any other questions? So I don't want to make this sound like I've, the reason I'm presenting this is because I have all the answers. I'm presenting this because I've managed to get on the wrong end of a lot of these. Right? I teach from experience on the failure side. I'm trying to make sure you guys don't run into those. Okay, thanks. You know how to find me.